How much don't you want that car? You want to load a TV or a couch into your pickup truck? Well, too bad. I didn't know you could drive stick. I can't. Chrysler may have been smaller than Ford and General Motors, but that doesn't mean they haven't had their share of weird cars over the past several decades. Chrysler is well known for taking some big risks with their car designs, some successful and some not so much. I happen to own one of the cars on this list, and I love it for just how weird it is. Here are my picks for the top 10 weirdest cars from Chrysler. Yeah, uh, LeBaron, right? No, Chrysler TC, TC. by Maserati. Right. <laughs> So for those of you who have seen my list of top 10 weirdest cars from GM and Ford, you knew this episode was on its way. Today Chrysler as a standalone company is no more, having joined with Fiat in 2014 and then the PSA Group in 2020 to become Stellantis. But back when Chrysler was the smallest of Detroit's big three, they definitely had their share of innovative designs. Some so innovative that today a better word for them may simply be weird. Like the last two top 10 lists, I will be including cars that are older than my channel's usual 1980s to mid-2000s time frame. Number 10, Dodge Rampage and Plymouth Scamp. It's a car. It's a truck. It drives like a car. It hauls like a truck. The idea of using a car platform as a basis for a pickup model was thought up long before 1982, when Chrysler decided to stretch their Dodge Omni and Plymouth Horizon platform to become small pickups. Chevrolet first launched the El Camino in 1959, and Ford launched the Ranchero in 1957. Subaru used their Leone wagon to become the Brat in 1978, which was the focus of my previous My Old Car episode. And these are just North American models, as Australia had their hold in youth starting in 1953. However, by the early 80s, the idea of grafting a pickup bed behind the front seats of a car started to lose its appeal in the US, as sales of all previously mentioned models were in a slow decline. That didn't stop Lee Iacocca from seeing an opportunity to create his own pickup from an existing compact car platform. Ooh, limit. That's who. The result was a Dodge Rampage, launched in 1982, sharing the same front end of what was first called the Omni 024, and would later be renamed, of all things, the Charger. Initially powered by a 2.2 liter four-cylinder, making 88 horsepower, the Rampage only weighed about 2,400 pounds, but could carry a payload of nearly half that weight, over 1,000 pounds, officially giving it a half-ton rating. The following year, Plymouth would get their own version of the same pickup because, well, they did, like virtually every other Dodge model back then. The Plymouth pickup was called the Scamp, and could potentially be the shortest model run in Chrysler history, lasting only for 1983, and only about 3,500 ever sold. Even a prototype of a high-performance Shelby version was created, although the closest that made it production were some turbocharged models that were referred to as direct connection rampages. Although Dodge sold a few more in 84 than in 83, 1984 would be the Rampage's final year. This end date had already been considered in 1983, which is probably why the Shelby version never got the green light for full production. Although Chrysler had a hard time giving away the remaining Rampages in their final year, today a mint condition one may actually be worth as much as, well, probably what a new one cost back in the 80s. It's Rampage, America's first sports pickup. Order it at your Dodge dealer now. Number 9, Eagle Wagon. So admittedly, this one is a stretch to call it a Chrysler, as it was first designed by American Motors Corporation, or AMC, and first went up for sale in 1980 as the AMC Eagle. But this car is occupying a spot in this list because of what it would ultimately become. As the first four-wheel drive passenger cars built in the US, the AMC Eagle was intended to be a more car-like alternative to AMC's Jeep lineup, but to offer the same off-road and foul weather capability as a Jeep. Early variations included two and four-door sedans, a cam-back version, and the most popular, a four-door wagon. However, it was AMC's Jeep lineup that attracted the attention of new CEO Lee Iacocca, who, thanks to a government bailout, had recently helped prevent Chrysler from going bankrupt. By 1984, sales of the AMC Eagle were in decline, so assembly moved to Canada, built alongside models from French automaker Renault, who had recently merged with AMC to help keep them afloat. With AMC's finances in trouble, Iacocca was able to broker a deal to buy AMC, and although Iacocca really wanted the Jeep lineup, they got the AMC Eagle as well, which by this point had sales drop below 10,000 per year, with AMC no longer doing any serious promotion of the car. Chrysler officially took over AMC in 1987, but instead of dropping the AMC Eagle altogether, Chrysler opted to keep the Eagle model in their lineup, except it couldn't call it an AMC. By this point, all the other non-wagon variations of the Eagle had been dropped, so the new name would simply become the Eagle Wagon, as if Eagle was the brand name, which it wasn't. 
Oddly enough, when the 1988 model year arrived and AMC as a company ceased to exist, the AMC badging remained on the 1988 Eagle wagons. In fact, the VIN, or Vehicle Identification Number, continued in the same format as they were for AMC. Yet it too became one of the shortest model runs in Chrysler history, being discontinued in December of 1987, with only 2,300 sold as Eagle wagons. Soon after, Chrysler would create a whole new brand called Eagle, which had absolutely zero connection to its forebear, as not a single Eagle brand model had four-wheel drive. This is Eagle Premier, European styling and the most aerodynamic sedan built on this continent. <laughs> Number eight, Dodge Dakota Convertible. By Convertible Dakota. <laughs> he probably thought he was the coolest dude in the world, and frankly, he kind of was. This entry on my list could be considered an example of Chrysler offering something that no one ever asked for. But that's not entirely true, as the marketing chief for Dodge at the time felt it would be just a niche product that could help bring buyers in, and hopefully keep them around long enough to at least buy a standard Dakota. But they also claimed that convertible pickups were popular in California, but no automaker offered it from the factory. The Dakota had been on sale since 1986, as Chrysler's first mid-size pickup. The all-new Dodge Dakota, North America's first mid-size pickup. But its size for the time made it closer to full-size, with extended bed models as long as some full-size trucks. But for 1989, when the idea for a convertible was proposed, the Dakota Sport model, which had no back seat, was chosen as a starting point. Each convertible was manufactured with a complete cab, and then later sent to ASC, or American Sunroof Corporation, which replaced the roof with a fixed roll bar and a manually operated cloth roof that occupied some of the bed space when lowered. Only about 2,800 Dakota ragtops were sold for 1989, and by 1990, sales dropped below 1,000. About eight more were sold for 1991, to fulfill Chrysler's contract with ASC through that model year. The lack of sales wasn't just because the idea of a soft top on a pickup is weird enough, but likely because the next most comparable vehicle was Chrysler's own Jeep Wrangler, which sold so well that there was no reason to promote the Dakota as an alternative. Despite its failure, it wasn't the last time a major automaker considered a convertible pickup, as GM tried it with their SSR over a decade later. And if you've seen my first sales flop video, or my weird GM Cars video, you know what happened to that one. You never give a woman your credit card. Right. Number seven, Chrysler Crossfire. You know when a dog's doing its number twos? Here's another one that made it out of my first sales flop episode. But the fact that it was a sales flop is not why I chose it for this list of weird Chryslers. Instead, this is an example of Chrysler trying to push the boundaries of its namesake division to be in the same league as its new owner, or partner, Daimler-Benz by selling its first two-seater sports car. Can the car of your dreams be an affordable reality? By the time the Crossfire was available for public sale, the idea that the merged company, known as Daimler Chrysler, would remain an equal partnership was becoming more fantasy than reality. Underneath the Crossfire's bodywork, which itself was designed and built by Carmen of Germany, its platform was the R170 generation of the Mercedes-Benz SLK, which first went up for sale in 1996. By the early 2000s, the SLK was ready for a redesign, but instead of providing the Crossfire with the next-gen SLK as a starting point, Daimler instead gave Chrysler the outgoing SLK platform. Looking back at it now, this approach made total sense for Daimler, as their next-gen SLK couldn't be upstaged by the Crossfire, but it still allowed Chrysler to tout the Crossfire's German engineering, despite the fact that this German engineering was, by that point, nearly a decade old. At first offered for the 2004 model year only as a hardtop coupe, with the rear end that was a bit controversial, that kind of arched back thing. Chrysler offered him a better looking convertible the following year, as well as an SRT6 model that had a supercharged V6 built by Mercedes performance team AMG. Despite those improvements, the first model year, when no convertible or SRT model was available, was the best selling with over 35,000, but dropped considerably each year until the final 2000 were sold in 2007. By that point, Chrysler's marriage with Daimler was over making it the first and last Chrysler, with a vast majority of its heritage being German. It's the all-American roadster, apart from the bits that are German. Number six, Chrysler TC by Maserati. You can expect soft Italian leather. What is that, velvet? Yes, this one was also on my sales flop list, but I also considered it a weird car for just why it existed. Although the previously featured Crossfire was an attempt to move Chrysler into the luxury sports car market, that was its second attempt, as a TC by Maserati would be the first. The TC was a pet project for Chrysler CEO Lee Iacocca, who had recently come off the success of the new K-Car and minivan models, not to mention orchestrating a government bailout to keep Chrysler out of bankruptcy. Iacocca believed it was time for a new halo car for Chrysler, and his fellow auto executive and friend, Alejandro de Tomaso, would make that dream a reality, albeit not a successful reality. 
Dave Tommaso, probably better known for his own short-lived sports car company, was head of Maserati back then and offered to help build and design a new roadster that would share the Chrysler and Maserati names. Started in 1988 with multiple assembly locations in Europe, the TC, which was supposed to mean turbo convertible, despite later being offered with a non-turbo V6, was planned to be launched before another similar looking car, the next-gen Chrysler LeBaron. However, design and production delays forced the TC to come to market after the LeBaron, making the TC appear to just be a gussied up LeBaron. With Maserati pricing, the TC costs far more than the LeBaron, and yet when you consider the whole project costs $600 million, the TC sale price of $37,000 still meant Chrysler lost about $45,000 per vehicle sold. All for a three-year-long pet project that Iacocca figured he had earned for bringing Chrysler back from the brink. And all for a car that tried to be the best Chrysler and the worst Maserati at the same time. Number 5. Dodge Ram SRT10 This one is weird for all the right reasons, at least for those who love performance cars in any shape or form. This entry on my list is also a prime example of Chrysler execs in their heyday of building cars that they knew would have a very limited market, but they didn't care because those at the top were serious car guys who had the clout to bring their dream cars to life. The first was a Dodge Viper with its 400 horsepower V10, launched in 1992. In 1996, as a concept for the Chicago Auto Show, the second gen version of the V10 was put into a Ram pickup. The reaction was so positive that by 2004, with the third gen Viper's 8.3 liter V10 now making 500 horsepower, it was ready to go back into a Ram again, but this time for public sale. Initially only offered on the single cab model and only with a manual transmission complete with a Hertz shifter, the Dodge Ram SRT10 also featured a unique hood with air scoops, a modified front fascia to allow for more air intake, stock 22 inch wheels, brakes from the Ram heavy duty model, a one inch drop in ride height, and leather seats with extra bolstering. It even had a spoiler in the back, which further emphasized the truck's true purpose, as the spoiler limited its cargo carrying ability. Although only just over 3,000 were sold for 2004, it was enough for Dodge to expand the SRT10 to the Ram's quad cab for 2005 and offering an automatic transmission, bumping sales to over 5,000 that year. However, 2006 would be its final year with less than 2,000 sold, as the market for such a weird truck had reached its limit. Speaking of limits, in 2004, a Ram SRT10 set a Guinness World Record for the fastest production truck, reaching 154 miles per hour. Now that may be weird, but it's super cool at the same time. Dodge likes things that are big and bad, and they built the biggest, baddest truck ever. Number four, Chrysler PT Cruiser. <laughs> Love it or hate it, no one can deny the impact the PT Cruiser had when it arrived in 2000. It was originally planned to be the Plymouth PT Cruiser, but required a branding change when Plymouth was shut down that same year. The PT Cruiser, whose name originated from its platform code of PT, and then later retconned to mean personal transport, was inspired by four-door wagon-style vehicles from the 1930s, and whose development originated around the same time of another retro-style car from Chrysler, which may be featured later in this list. The inside of the car was supposed to have some retro clues as well, although the quality of the materials made it seem to be more cheap than retro. Designed by Brian Nesbitt, who would later leave Chrysler to join GM and pen their very similar looking Chevy HHR, over 90,000 PT Cruisers were sold in 2000 for the 2001 model year and increased over 144,000 the following year, making it a bona fide hit for Chrysler. The PT was offered in various special editions, including flame decals and fake wood paneling, and a GT model featuring Chrysler's SRT4 turbo engine. However, the curse with retro styling is that the car couldn't change much without losing the retro look, and with so many on the road in the first few years, the cool retro look eventually started to lose its appeal. A two-door convertible was offered starting in 2005, whose looks were even more polarizing than the original four-door, and only lasted until 2008. It's 17 and a half, oh I can't even look at it. By that point, overall sales had dropped to about a third of their peak, and Chrysler quietly ran out production by 2010. Today, many who see a PT Cruiser still on the road may think that its goofy look made it a failure, not realizing that over 1.3 million of them were sold over 10 years, which is nowhere near a sales flop. Instead, it was another example of Chrysler taking a gamble with a weird car that, at least in the short term, paid off well. You've sunk my Cruiser. Number 3. Chrysler Turbine The most unusual consumer test program ever launched in the automotive industry. To be included on these lists, I have only been including cars that were available to the public which means excluding concept cars. Admittedly, this next entry barely meets my criteria, as Chrysler only built 55 units of this model, of which 50 were provided to the public as a test program. 
The Chrysler turbine's name pretty much explains what the point of the car was, replacing a typical internal combustion engine with a turbine similar to an airplane. The original idea originated in the 1930s, and prototypes built in the 1950s, but the first cars available for the public didn't become reality until 1963. The first public evaluation program under controlled test conditions ever attempted. Chrysler pushed the idea of the turbine being far superior to gas engines, thanks to their ability to use multiple types of fuel, having fewer moving parts that required less maintenance, and predicted to last longer than conventional engines. In fact, it didn't even have a radiator or any cooling system. You're looking at a practical gas turbine engine for passenger cars. Over 200 drivers were employed to drive the 50 test cars in over 130 U.S. cities, starting in October of 1963. The car bodies were designed and built by German coach builder Gia. By the end of the program in early 1968, over a million combined miles were driven. The reaction of the public was simply overwhelming. Sadly, the test brought to light the many downsides of turbine engines such as its confusing eight-step procedure to start it, poor fuel economy, subpar acceleration, and the biggest impact of daily driving, they were simply too loud. Although some drivers said they liked the jet engine sound. It also didn't help that standard leaded gasoline, which was the most widely available in gas stations at the time, was not recommended by Chrysler due to debilitating deposits, which leaded gas could leave in the engine. Following the end of testing in 1968, most of the test cars were crushed to avoid resale similar to what GM would do many years later with their EV1. Only nine of the cars were preserved, and only one of those ended up in private ownership, that of course being Jay Leno. Jay's car is one of only three remaining whose power plant wasn't rendered inoperable by Chrysler. Chrysler would later try to develop improved turbine engines in the 1970s, but fuel efficiency standards of the time prevented any chance of them reaching production, making the Chrysler turbine a one-of-a-kind in Chrysler's history. I mean, the car is 50 years old, but it still has a sense of, you know, the Number two, Chrysler and DeSoto Airflow. For this entry, I'm going way back to include a car that foreshadowed the risk taking of Chrysler of the 90s and 2000s. In 1930, Chrysler engineers tested more aerodynamic body styles to see where those body styles were potentially hindering the car's fuel efficiency. In addition to the body shape, they also looked at the placement of the engine and seating to improve weight distribution which before generally resulted in 65% or more of the weight in the rear of the car, which in turn meant reduced stability and passenger comfort. Their new design was a full steel unibody, unlike most other models at the time, that still had wood frames inside their sheet metal exterior. They also moved the engine more over the front axle and kept the seating between the axles, resulting in nearly 50-50 weight distribution when passengers were on board. But most notably, the front end of the car had the more upright grille and headlamps replaced with a more waterfall design that was, at the time, extremely radical for an automobile. Chrysler offered the new model, called the Airflow, starting in 1934. They also offered a similar car for its DeSoto division, giving it the same name. The Chrysler division offered other models at the time, however DeSoto only offered the Airflow for that year. Despite heavy marketing of how much safer the Airflow was, compared to a typical car, most consumers couldn't get past the radical front end, and instead, it gained a reputation for being unsafe. Sales tanked, which especially hurt DeSoto, as they had no other more conventional model to sell, forcing Chrysler to add its better-selling and more conventional Airstream model to DeSoto's lineup for 1935. Despite Walter P. Chrysler's full backing and expectation of a sales success, the Airflow was an unexpected marketing failure. Chrysler's engineers were forced to rework the front end for 1935 to make the grille more upright, and in 1936, they added a more traditional trunk in the rear, both of which negated some of the aerodynamic advantages the original car had. The Chrysler Airstream models were selling nearly 4 to 1 compared to the Airflow, which was discontinued for DeSoto after 1936. The Chrysler version stayed on into 1937, with its final version sporting a grille that was nearly as upright as other models, but the damage was already done. Yet despite that history, Chrysler decided to use the Airflow name for a new EV concept in 2022. I suspect most consumers won't recognize the name, but for those that do and know the history, it seems like a bad omen to me. Every journey will be truly an experience. Number one, Plymouth Prowler. Yeah. Yes, this old car, a car that I own, I consider to be the weirdest car that Chrysler has ever produced. Those who don't get it or don't like it never will, and that's fine with us. In fact, it could easily make it onto anyone's top 10 list of weird cars of any make and of any time, which is why I made it my goal to someday own one. Yes, I totally get that weird cars are typically not the most beautiful, and from certain angles, I also totally get why many consider the Prowler to be ugly as sin. And I know many hate it for its hot rod looks and not so hot rod power, 
But if you get past a few compromises and better understand its history and the whole reason for existence, you may be in for a surprise. Although the Prowler may have officially come from the minds of Chrysler execs Bob Lutz and Tom Gale, the common belief is that Chuck Foos designed it, which is not true, as instead he helped inspire the idea with his own prototype. To say that I designed the Prowler is a slap in the face to the engineers and designers that finished that car, but it was definitely the, uh, shall we say, the birth point of the car. Fresh off the heels of their most powerful production vehicle, the 10-cylinder Dodge Viper, and the bump it provided to the Dodge brand, Chrysler needed another halo car to help turn around its Plymouth division, which had been churning out nothing but Dodge and Chrysler lookalikes for decades, with the last unique car from Plymouth being the 69 Barracuda. A concept was shown at the Detroit Auto Show in 1993 with a hugely positive public response. But to justify the cost of production for the 1997 production model, the Prowler project would be a testbed for aluminum construction of the frame and most body panels, or about 40% of the car's 2,800 pound weight making it the most aluminum intensive car ever produced up to that point. The most beautiful car in the world. But all that aluminum meant more risk of body flex, so a big high torque engine wasn't a good match. Not to mention that they had limited space in its triangle shaped engine bay. Well, it's not exactly for everyone, is it? That's kind of the point. The result was an iron block V6 taken from the Chrysler LH cars, which was later upgraded to an aluminum block V6 for 1999. Rated at 253 horsepower, it was faster than Chrysler's only V8 they had at the time for the Dodge Ram, which wouldn't have fit in the Prowler anyway. Yet despite the new V6 having more power than their older V8, trying to promote a modern hot rod with a V6 was admittedly a tough sell. Not to mention the rear transaxial and huge 20-inch wheels taking up so much space in the rear that there was only a sliver of trunk space, meaning almost zero practicality for a car that cost over 40 grand at the time. With each car hand-built alongside the Viper in Detroit, production was limited anyway, and ultimately it couldn't turn around Plymouth, as that brand folded at the start of 2001. By 2002, now rebranded as the Chrysler Prowler, production was forced to end after only five years and 11,700 built, thanks to it no longer meeting crash protection requirements for 2003. However, today, low mileage models often sell for $30,000 or more, so it's bucking the trend for typical depreciation of 20 plus year old cars. Just don't drive one if you prefer to remain incognito. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid-2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time. Here, take the wheel. What the?